Today, our last lecture in this course, I want to talk about an influenza virus called H5N1. And this is going to be a combination of a lot of the science that you've learned in this course. But this story is also an example of what happens when science and society intersect and what happens when certain individuals don't understand science and when the general public begins to mistrust scientists. So it's a, it's a story of both science and society's reaction to it. And it's a story that played out over the last couple of years, which I think is really instructive. It's a good way to put an end to this course. So the virus we're going to talk about is an influenza virus, which we introduced a long time ago. And there is a model of it on the left. It is a virus with a segmented RNA genome. This is going to be very important for our discussion today. And the eight segments are shown here in green, each encoding one or two proteins. It's encased in a lipid envelope. And in the envelope are uh, a couple of different viral proteins. The two major ones, of course, are the hemagglutinin, which is shown here in blue, uh, and the neuraminidase, which is in, uh, I guess that's magenta. And the hemagglutinin and neuraminidase are, of course, important for interacting with the host cell. Hemagglutinin binding the cell receptor and the neuraminidase cleaving it. As far as we know, so far, we've discovered viruses out there in nature with 18 different HA molecules when you classify them by sequence and 11 different neuraminidase molecules. I'm sure there are more out there. We just haven't found them yet. However, among human strains, the strains that infect us on a yearly basis and are transmitted effect efficiently from human to human, there are only a few, the H1, H2, and H3 hemagglutinins, and the N1 and N2 neuraminidases. All right, again, viruses with these hemagglutinins and neuraminidases are the only ones that have established themselves in humans and can be considered uh, a stable human-human cycle to, to go back to our uh, evolution lecture. All of those hemagglutinins and neuraminidases can be found in birds. So birds appear to be the natural reservoir of influenza viruses. The, again, the human strains pass from human to human, but we acquire new ones from the aquatic reservoir. And all sorts of birds, ducks, water birds, and some terrestrial birds, ducks, geese, swans, gulls, terns, shorebirds, and many others, these are the animals that harbor all of the influenza viruses that we know of. In the bird, the infection is different from it is in people. So you know an influenza in humans is a respiratory infection. But in birds, it, the virus replicates in the gastrointestinal tract. The birds ingest the virus, it replicates in their tract, and then the birds shed it. So see up on the upper right here is a car that's been parked under a tree that's had a lot of birds in it, and it's covered with bird feces. And all of that feces probably contains a lot of influenza virus. And think of this as birds are flying through the air. You know, birds don't go to a bathroom. They, they excrete while they're flying. So they're providing a nice aerosol of influenza virus. So among all the other things I've told you, that's, that's one you can file away as well. Next time you see a gull or a duck, you'll probably never look at them uh, the same because they're shedding, they're shedding influenza viruses all over the world. The, it, the virus will replicate in the respiratory tract of birds, but to a much lesser extent. It's mainly a GI infection uh, in these animals. And in aquatic birds in particular, uh, ducks and seagulls and so forth, it's mainly an asymptomatic infection, with the exception of the virus that's our star today, H5N1. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Now in the middle here is a, an important picture. It's, it's kind of an outline of the ecology of influenza viruses. Again, the aquatic birds are the reservoir, 
and they spread them to many other species. They can spread them to seals, terrestrial birds, poultry, the, the birds that we grow for eggs and food. Uh, they can spread to whales. They can spread to pigs, uh, cats, and dogs, and horses. And we can acquire various viruses from pigs and birds as well, as you will see today. So really complicated ecology, perhaps more so than any virus that we know very well. So the bird is the central player in the ecology of influenza viruses. Now we have to go back to talk a little bit about the hemagglutinin to understand today's story. Um, avian influenza strains, and as you can guess, there are a lot of them because I just said all the viruses we know about circulate in birds. They are classified, one way of classifying them is based on their pathogenicity in chickens. That is domestic chickens that we use for food of various sorts. We inoculate them and we classify them based on their pathogenicity. So they're the so-called low pathogenicity strains, LPAI, low pathogenicity avian influenza. Uh, they cause mild respiratory disease and they decrease the egg production. One of the other parameters is that the chickens get depressed. Okay? <laughs> so normally chickens are very happy, but when they get low pathogenicity influenza, they get depressed. That's actually one of the symptoms. Now, on the other hand, there's high pathogenicity viruses, and H5 is one of them. H7 is another one. These, you inoculate into a chicken, they are lethal. They will kill the animal. And among other characteristics, a very important molecular characteristic of these viruses is that they have a multiple sequence or a multiple stretch of basic amino acids at the HA cleavage site. Now, when we last talked about this, this was a long time ago. So here is a linear schematic of the hemagglutinin. And again, that's one of those two glycoproteins that's in the envelope of the virus. Uh, here's the viral envelope here, transmembrane sequence. Here's the red is the hemagglutinin. You can see there are lots of disulfide bonds. And here is the cleavage site, right here, the little yellow triangle. And here it's showing one basic amino acid. Uh, and low, one basic amino acid at this cleavage site is characteristic of low pathogenicity strains. And that's because this site is only cleaved by proteases that are present in the respiratory tract. Now the high pathogenicity viruses have a multiple basic amino acid sequence at the cleavage site, which simply means that it can be cleaved by proteinases that are ubiquitous, that are throughout the body. And that is why these viruses can replicate in different places in the bird. And we think this is why H5N1 can replicate at different places in people as well, as you'll see. Now, why is cleavage of the HA important? Cleavage is important to liberate the end terminus of the fusion peptide. And that's the sequence that's going to insert into the membrane of the endosome when the pH drops as the virus comes into the cell. Uh, this fusion peptide is going to be thrust up into the membrane. It's normally buried, so it doesn't fuse randomly with membranes. It's going to be thrust up into the endosomal membrane where it will catalyze fusion so the viral RNA can get out. All right, so those are some properties of low and high pathogenicity uh, avian influenza viruses. Now, there have been many outbreaks of, of high pathogenicity uh, influenza viruses over the year. This is just a table from uh, 1959 to the present. And you can see the viruses that caused them here. The way that influenza viruses are named are according to the uh, animal of origin here. You can see uh, outbreaks not only in chickens, domestic chickens on farms, and turkeys, but also in wild birds, such as terns here. And you can see quite large numbers. Look at this one. In 1983 in Pennsylvania, uh, 17 million chickens and turkeys were infected. These, of course, are on farms. And the way you stop these outbreaks, unfortunately, is you have to slaughter all the animals on a farm to prevent the virus from spreading among the farm or to other farms as well. So that's called culling. And that's why these viruses are agriculturally significant. So the virus is going from wild birds to the chickens and turkeys on the farm because they are exposed to them, of course. And you can see lots of other outbreaks here of substantial numbers of um, 
of, of poultry, millions up to millions in, in many of these cases. So they've been going on uh, for quite a long time. But it wasn't until 1997 that these viruses began to infect people. So up until that time, we regarded them as agriculturally substantial because they interfered with the production of chickens and turkeys, but they didn't really infect people as far as we knew. I'm sure they did, but we just weren't detecting it. But in 1997, in the live bird markets of Hong Kong, uh, this is, these are places where you can go and buy your, your, your birds, chickens and turkeys and so forth. They're live there and you pick one out and it's slaughtered and, and defeathered and so forth for you. There was an outbreak of high pathogenicity H5N1 in the bird market. So birds, live birds at the market started uh, to die. This virus that emerged at that time, an H5N1 strain, as a reassortment of previously circulating influenza viruses. Now, because these viruses have segmented genomes, again, when they co-infect cells, you make all kinds of new viruses at the end. You make reassortants because, because the RNAs are segmented, it's very easy for them to mix in a co-infected cell. So that will be a theme throughout this session today. Reassortment generates new influenza viruses. And here in 1997, during this outbreak, in the live bird markets. These were the first recognized human infections. There were 18 human infections with this virus, H5N1, and six deaths. So this was the first time that we saw an avian influenza virus infecting people. Uh, the, all the birds in the market were slaughtered, and many, many birds, and this eliminated the spread. It was gone for a while, but in, in 2001 and 2002, that virus, H5N1, reemerged in poultry and wild birds, and uh, it's been with us ever since. Now, in the, the first outbreak, uh, mainly poultry, chickens and turkeys, were dying of infection, but later on, waterfowl began to die, and this has never been seen before uh, with H5N1. There was a particularly substantial outbreak in 2005 at a lake in China, an outbreak among wild birds that has been studied uh, quite extensively. And the virus that emerged during that outbreak has since spread globally. It's in over uh, 60 different countries uh, globally. You can see here it's enzootic in poultry, which means the virus is always there in many different countries. It's not, el it's not all over the world but it is, has sub spread substantially since its origins uh, in China, as you can see. And how has the virus spread? Well, birds, aquatic birds, of course, fly. Uh, they have very uh, long migra migratory routes, and they spread the virus that way. And as I said, they're shedding the virus as they fly. But also the movement of infected poultry. So you can't screen every animal in, in a, on a chicken or turkey farm. And if you move these animals around, it will spread infection as well. There's also a very vibrant illegal bird trade throughout the world, exotic bird trade, I should say. Uh, and in particular, uh, the infection spread to Europe through uh, some of this bird trade as well. Other animals can be infected with these viruses. There's one example in Thailand where some of the cats in the zoo, the lions and tigers and so forth, they're fed chickens as part of their food. And at one point they were given H5N1 infected chickens and the Thai cats got sick as well. So many animals seem to be susceptible to this virus. In people, it has continued to infect since that first outbreak in 1997. So there have been a number of H5N1 infections in humans, and this is the clinical course of disease. It's quite different from seasonal or even pandemic uh, influenza. It has a very aggressive clinical course. It typically has lower respiratory tract uh, involvement and characterized by what we call acute respiratory distress syndrome. Uh, this is in part when the lungs begin to feel, fill with fluid and oxygen levels in the blood drop because you can't uh, exchange enough gases, and this is a very serious situation. Interestingly, there can also be gastrointestinal symptoms. These H5N1 infections are often accompanied by diarrhea, vomiting, and abdominal pain. There's some evidence that the virus is actually replicating somewhere 
in the gastrointestinal tract and is shed in the human feces and can also re re replicate elsewhere. So there's evidence for systemic spread. Again, we think this is because these viruses have at the HA cleavage site a stretch of multibasic amino acids, which can be cleaved by proteases that are in many parts of our body. We talked a long time ago about the tropism of viruses and what controls it. And one of the regulators of the tropism of influenza virus is cleavage of the HA. And we said that typically influenza viruses are restricted to the respiratory tract because the protease needed for cleavage is there. Now, if these viruses can be cleaved by ubiquitous proteases, the virus could replicate elsewhere as well. However, importantly, there has been really no transmission among humans. All the infections seem to be limited to primary contact with poultry or someone who is in the family of someone who has had contact with poultry. And that's the good news. So anyone who is involved with handling poultry, either killing them or defeathering or handling them, uh, preparing them from the raw state, they're all at risk for infection if the birds uh, are, infection, are infected. So we say this virus has pandemic potential, has potential to spread globally because it's endemic in poultry in many parts of the world. So the poultry is always infected. It's in wild birds as well. And we have no immunity. Nobody has immunity, or very, very few people have immunity to H5N1 influenza viruses in the human population. And because of the human infections, we'll look at those in a moment, this is why we consider this virus to have a pandemic potential. So here's a summary of, uh, by WHO, World Health Organization, of all the human H5N1 infections um, to date. Uh, these, you can see the countries in which they're located. I'll have another table in a moment with uh, the numbers. But you can see um, the, the, hatch, or the hatch marks here are countries where H5N1 uh, infections have occurred. And in addition, the virus has been found in local birds. Uh, so you can see it began, of course, uh, in Hong Kong. China has had some cases, but not a lot. The, the countries with the highest burdens of cases, Indonesia, uh, Vietnam is another one of them. Uh, Egypt has had quite a bit. Uh, and then a few other countries as well. Last year, a case was imported into Canada. A woman who had been traveling in China uh, went to Canada where she became ill and she was diagnosed with H5N1 influenza. And this, of course, set up a scare, but the virus didn't spread from her and we wouldn't expect it to because that's one of the characteristics. It does not spread effectively from person to person. So here's the table summarizing uh, all of the cases since uh, 2003. So this, excludes those cases in 1997, 16 or 18 cases. So here's the total, 650 cases. And you can see, again, the burden in Indonesia, Egypt, uh, China has had a few uh, more, Vietnam has quite a few, and then um, Cambodia, Turkey. Uh, and here are the deaths, 386. So it has spread substantially from its origins in China, but it's not everywhere, of course. The case definition for H5N1 infection in humans is the following. It's an acute febrile respiratory illness, and you have to have known H5 exposure in the preceding days. So you have to know that you've been exposed to this virus. And the infection has to be confirmed by a WHO-approved lab showing that you have H5 uh, infection. The problem with this definition is that it doesn't allow for asymptomatic infections. And, um, because the illness is part of the case definition. So we actually do not know how many infections there are globally and how serious this infection really is. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. Now, this kind of diagnosis is not likely to uh, take place in rural areas where there's poor health care systems. And this is where most of the H5 infections occur. So you need a, a good hospital or a laboratory to carry out these diagnostic tests and check for infection. That simply doesn't happen in many places where H5 is endemic. So I think that we have underreported um, the, the amount of H5 infection globally. So let's calculate the case fatality ratio for this virus. That means uh, the number of deaths divided by 
the number of confirmed cases. And confirmed means by WHO criteria, which I just showed you on the previous slide. That's the case fatality ratio, 59%. This is why many people are afraid of this virus, because it kills 60% of the people who are confirmed to have H5N1 influenza. In my opinion, and that of many others, the mortality rate is likely to be much lower. That is, the number of deaths divided by the total number of infections. So the denominator is the difference, the total number of infections versus um, the confirmed infections, which is what the case fatality ratio is. We don't know how many H5 infections actually occur in humans. So this number, in terms of the mortality rate, could be substantially lower if there are a lot of inapparent infections. And it might not be as scary uh, as people think. Now let's compare it to a pandemic virus that established itself in humans. In 2009, a new pandemic strain emerged, uh, and it's called H1N1. And these are some numbers for the first year in the US from the CDC. There were a total of 12,500 deaths in the US and 274,000 hospitalizations. So we have a pretty good influenza monitoring system. So if you divide those two numbers, you get the case fatality ratio, which is 4.5%. So this is a typical uh, influenza virus, uh, a pandemic strain newly introduced into the population, causing a little more death than usual. However, for this virus, we can calculate the mortality rate because since we have such a good flu reporting system, we know that there were 60,800,000 cases in the US uh, during that first pandemic year. So now if you take that and put on top, so you take 12,000 deaths divided by 60 million, you get 0.02% mortality ratio. And this is typical for influenza virus as well. So this is what we do not know for H5N1 influenza. We know uh, the mortality ratio, and, and indeed it is higher than this virus, but the actual uh, mortality rate is unknown because, again, we don't know all of the H5N1 infections. There's some evidence that there are asymptomatic H5N1 infections. We've talked at many times in this course that many viruses do not cause disease in every individual that's been infected. And this was a paper uh, published uh, a couple of years ago uh, from uh, Peter Palazzi's laboratory here in New York City. Sarrow evidence for H5N1 influenza infections. What they did is a meta-analysis. A meta-analysis is when you take everyone else's data and you put it all together and analyze it. So they took, uh, they looked at all the serological studies uh, that had been done looking for antibodies in people to avian H5 influenza virus. And what they concluded was that 1 to 2% of more than 12,000 study participants in 20 studies had several evidence for prior H5N1 infection. So 1 to 2%, if there are millions of uh, infections globally, this is, is quite a high number of people and could substantially uh, affect the fatality rate. Now, many people don't believe these serological studies. They say they're simply cross-reactivity with related but not identical viruses. And that's a fair argument because we just look for antibodies that will bind to an H5 hemagglutinin. You don't know if a closely reacting virus caused the induction of those antibodies. So here's a different approach which was done in a Vietnamese co cohort. These are high-risk individuals. Vietnam, there have been a lot of H5N1 cases. Uh, there's a poultry industry there and, and poultry workers who are at risk for being infected. So what they did is draw blood from a number of these individuals and they, they purified peripheral blood mononuclear nuclear cells, so the white blood cells uh, that are part of your immune response, and this would include B and T cells, of course. And then they put these in culture and they added to the cells a mixture of peptides. These are peptides that they had purchased short 20, 30 amino acid peptides, maybe, maybe less, which represent all the possible peptides from all the influenza virus proteins. A lot of different peptides here. The idea being that you want to mimic the peptides that are displayed on the surface of an infected cell in class one 
MHC that would be recognized by cytotoxic T cells. So if there is a peptide that is recognized by one of the lymphocytes from these patients, uh, the, you can measure that. The lymphocytes become activated and they produce things that you can measure in culture. So you can tell when you've added a peptide that matches with an MHC on one of these patients' T cells. Excuse me. <clears throat> Twenty percent of this cohort responded to H5 peptides. So the PBMCs from 20% of these individuals reacted when they added influenza H5 uh, derived peptides. So that means that these individuals probably were infected at some point. They have memory T cells that recognize peptides derived from H5N1 influenza virus. So this is a totally different approach from serology. Serology, you're looking for antibodies. Here, we're looking for T cells uh, that will recognize a peptide. Normally, the peptide would be presented in MHC class 1, and the T cell would recognize it via its T cell receptor. But in this assay, you just add purified peptide to the T cells. If the peptide matches and is recognized by the T cell receptor, the T cells proliferate and they begin to make cytokines, which you can measure. So an independent evidence that there are asymptomatic infections. This cohort, by the way, didn't have any uh, evidence of H5N1 infection. They had no serious respiratory disease. Two other studies which have since been published. One, another study in a Viet Vietnam. This was a Vietnamese household where um, the family, which consisted of a father and mother and, and several children, um, regularly worked with poultry. In fact, they had chickens in the bedroom and they would slaughter these and eat them periodically. So they had exposure to chickens. Now, the father in this family contracted in a serious respiratory disease. He was taken to the hospital, and he was diagnosed with H5N1 influenza. And he unfortunately died uh, within a few days. Uh, but everyone else in the hospital was put on an antiviral. And uh, in particular, the daughter seroconverted she made antibodies to H5N1 influenza. She was fine. She didn't get sick. So she seroconverted. She might not have gotten sick because of the antiviral, so we don't know. But there's just one example of a, of a spread infection. The other study is, was done in Bangladesh, and this was a study of antibodies to the virus in poultry workers. Lots of poultry farms throughout Bangladesh. Each dot are farms, uh, poultry farms throughout the country. And there are live markets as well where the poultry are sold. And there have been outbreaks of avian influenza at each of these blue dots. So all these workers are at risk. So they took hundreds and hundreds of serum samples, zero antibodies against H5N1 influenza virus. This means to me that our methods are not right. We're not detecting antibodies because I cannot believe that none of these hundreds of workers or have never encountered H5 and never been infected. Now again, none of them reported serious influenza-like disease. I think what happens is the antibodies decline very rapidly after infection, and you can't pick them up by conventional antibody assays. I think you need to look for virus very early on in infection by a sensitive method like PCR. So we can't yet say what is the case fatality ratio for this virus. But there are people out there, if you read the newspapers, you will see them say that H5N1 influenza is 60% lethal. Well, without saying what that means, the number means nothing. Now you know what it means. It's the case fatality ratio. It just means that 60% of people with confirmed infection die. But that doesn't mean that uh, everyone will die who is infected. And this is an important point. So this brings us to a consideration. How much should we worry about H5N1? influenza. So here are some of the facts. It's endemic in poultry. There's this issue about the case fatality rate. I, I recognize that it's a, quite a lethal virus because 60% even of confirmed infections is a lot. We don't know if those individuals have other health problems. Nevertheless, we can say that it's a, it's a serious virus. Doesn't transmit among people. And I don't know if it will ever. It's been circulating for many, many years now, since at least the 50s, maybe before. It has not yet adapted to be able to circulate. Of course, we can't predict whether such changes will occur to do that, but so far it's had its chances and it hasn't <coughs> happened. And again, as I said earlier, only viruses with H1, H2, and H3 hemagglutinins can transmit effectively among people. 
So how much money should we spend on this? Right now, many countries in the world are spending billions and billions of dollars uh, making vaccines, getting prepared for an H5 uh, outbreak, doing lots of research on it. I'm not sure how much we need to do. Because as you will see, there are many threats out there and you can't respond to every one of them. You don't have the resources, and when you put too much into one thing, then you ignore other areas which are very important. So it's really a thorny uh, issue. There are other avian influenza viruses out there. I told you at the onset, every flu virus we know is in birds. In 1998, H9N2 viruses were transmitted from birds to pigs in humans. These were not fatal human infections, though. 2003 an outbreak of H7N7 in birds in the Netherlands. There are 89 human infections and evidence for human-to-human -human transmission uh, among three individuals. 2004, two humans infected with an H7N3 uh, after an outbreak, again, in poultry in Canada, so going from poultry to humans. And these are some other avian influenza viruses out there that have known to be have caused infections uh, in people. We'll talk about the H79 outbreak, which is currently ongoing in China uh, at the end of this uh, session. Now, what gives these viruses the ability to replicate in people and in birds? So the receptor is another determinant. Besides the cleavage site of the HA, which determines the tropism, the receptor is important. Avian strains, as you know, the receptor for the HA is sialic acid, which is a sugar as part of a sugar chain linked to a protein. So here's a glycoprotein on the left, sugar chain, sialic acid is the last sugar in the sugar chain. And sialic acid is the receptor for influenza viruses. Avian strains prefer alpha-2,3 linked sialic acid. That's shown here, sialic acid, the terminal sugar linked to a galactose, which is the next sugar in the chain, by an alpha-2,3 linkage. That's all that means. Human strains prefer alpha-2-6 linkage. So this uh, carbon would be linked to carbon number six on the galactose. So these, are, these are not absolutes, they are preferences. And birds like alpha-2-3, humans like alpha-2-6. Influenza H5N1 viruses globally in the last 10 or 20 years have been trending towards liking alpha-2-6 linked sialic acids. We have isolated more and more H5N1 viruses that are, are really liking alpha-2,6 more than they ever had before. I'm not sure why this is. I, birds, of course, do have some alpha-2,6 uh, linked sialic acids, but they mainly have alpha-2,3. But there is some in birds, and that may be selecting for viruses uh, that can do that. Certainly humans are not providing the selection because there aren't enough infections uh, to do that. So here's the distribution of these sialic acids in the human respiratory tract. You can see starting up here in the nasal mucosa and the paranasal sinuses, alpha-2,6 predominate, the pharynx, the larynx, alpha-2,6. Then when you move down into the trachea, you have a mix. Uh, in the bronchus, there's a mix of alpha-2,6 and alpha-2,3. You can go all the way down to the bronchial, you see a mix as well. And then the alveoli, the very ends, the sacs at the very end of the lung, they have alpha-2,3. So in order to get an a H5N1 infection in human, you probably need to get access to some of these alpha-2,3 receptors. So the conventional idea is that you have to inhale a lot of virus very deeply into your respiratory tract where the virus can uh, engage alpha-2,3 receptors and replicate and then spread elsewhere. So the, the typical scenario is a child hugging a chicken. This is their pet. And you hug the chicken and the child is getting aerosols of influenza virus from the chicken and inhaling it deep into the lungs. Now there's uh, one situation where alpha-2,3 may be more accessible and that is in the eye. The cornea, the conjunctival membranes lining the cornea, uh, the nasolacrimal ducts. So there is a duct con connecting your eye to your nose, and, and fluids go through that. So viruses, avian influenza viruses, could actually infect your eye tissues and then drain into your nose, and then you could it could drain down into your lower lung as well. So there is actually evidence that this was part of the Netherlands outbreak of avian influenza virus. A number of in poultry workers had conjunctivitis. 
inflammation of the conjunctival membranes caused by in, that avian influenza virus strain. So that's how one way it's thought that these could uh, get into our lungs. Which of the following are important for influenza virus H5N1 infection of humans? Well, we have one and two and three and five. So some of you said a single amino acid, single. No, a single amino acid is what restricts virus to the respiratory tract. We think that a multi-basic multi amino acid sequence is important uh, for those high pathogenicity strains. Uh, binding to alpha-2,3 sialic acids, those are present uh, deep in the lung, but these are avian receptors, and we think that, in fact, to infect humans, somehow also alpha-2,6 has to be engaged as well. Handling poultry is certainly a risk factor. Uh, contact with pigs uh, is not. So this is the best ones. I can understand where some of you uh, picked the other one, maybe number two, uh, but fortunately, none of you picked contact with pigs, so it is contact with poultry. Now, as I said earlier, one of the keys here is that these H5N1 viruses don't transmit among humans. And why not? Why don't they? And to, to answer this question, you need an animal model, because obviously you can't do experiments in humans. And the model that's been used is the ferret, which is shown up here. Ferrets are believed to respond to influenza better than any other animals that have been used, including mice or primates, amazingly, or um, guinea pigs. They have respiratory tracts similar to those of humans. They sneeze, they cough, they develop a fever, very much like human influenza. So they've been used to study transmission. And the way you do these experiments is you put ferrets in a set of cages in a room, and you infect them intranasally with virus. And then there's an adjacent set of cages next to those with more ferrets. And you look at them periodically to see the virus going through the air and infecting the second cage of uninoculated ferrets. So that's an aerosol transmission experiment. So wild type H5N1 virus that you get from a bird does not transmit among ferrets, neither, just as it doesn't transmit among humans. If you change the sialic acid specificity so that the virus now recognizes alpha-2,6 linked amino acids, and this is what will help uh, H5N1s replicate in human cells, it still does not transmit among ferrets. So that's not enough. Uh, the neuraminidase, when you do these changes, you also have to change the neuraminidase because the neuraminidase has to be able to cleave the same kind of sialic acid that the HA is recognizing. So you put changes in the neuraminidase as well. You also have to introduce changes in the RNA polymerase. I'll show you those in a moment. Remember, these viruses encode an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase that uh, replicates the genome and makes mRNAs. Avian RNA polymerases of influenza virus don't work well in mammalian cells. But if you put mutations in the polymerase, if you make amino acid changes in the polymerase, then it replicates better because it makes more RNA. So these changes you also uh, have also been put into H5N1 viruses, but they do not enable transmission. So changing the receptor, the neuraminidase, the RNA polymerase is not enough to get transmission. So that's where this controversy begins, starting with these two guys who are virologists. Uh, this is Yoshi Kawaoka. He's at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And at the University of Tokyo, he shuttled. He has two jobs, and he flies back and forth every two weeks. Uh, and he works on influenza virus. And this is Ron Fouché. He's from the Netherlands. They both did experiments to try and get uh, H5N1 influenza virus to transmit a by aerosol among ferrets. And I did interviews with both of these guys uh, here over the past couple of years where they talked about this work. The story begins with this article in Science Insider in uh, November 2011. It starts off, this is by Martin Enserich, locked up in the bowels of the medical facility building here lies a virus that could change world history if it were ever set free. This is just such journalistic pandering. It's really <laughs> horrible. But I will try to control myself. This virus is an H5N1. <laughs> avian influenza strain that has been genetically altered and is now easily transmissible between ferrets. 
the animals that most closely mimic the human response to flu. Scientists believe it's likely that the pathogen, if it emerged in nature or were released, would trigger a pandemic quite possibly with many millions of death. Okay, so Ron Fouché called it one of the most da dangerous viruses you can make. And he had submitted this paper for publication. And then Kawaoka also did similar work, but he did not respond to interviews. And I just wish Fouché had not responded to interviews as well, because this is what got this whole, uh, this whole problem started. Okay, so um, he said, and the writer conveyed that this virus could wipe out uh, humanity if it were released. <laughs> so what, what exactly did he do? So that was the first, that article that I just showed you was the first that many of us had seen of it. We hadn't seen the research paper yet, but it turns out that in September of 2011, Fouché gave a talk at a meeting in Malta where he presented all the details. What he did is he introduced three amino acid changes into H5N1 to get it to replicate in mammals. And I think these are changes to allow switch to alpha-2,6 sialic acid specificity and a polymerase change to get better replication, which I've talked to you about. That virus did not transmit by aerosol among ferrets. Then he said he passed the virus from ferret to ferret 10 times. Put the virus in the nose of the ferret, you wait a few days until the virus replicates, and you harvest it, you grow it, and you put it in a new ferret. So he did that 10 times, and then after 10 times, he got a virus that could transmit by aerosol uh, from ferret to ferret right, in adjacent cages. But he wasn't allowed to tell us what the mutations were because he was being scientifically censored by an organization that I'll talk about in a moment. Before this, it turns out that there was an article published uh, in the New Scientist before that first Science Express article that I just showed you. It's called Five Easy Mutations. You know what that's a play on, right? Five easy pieces. <laughs> no film f uh, aficionados here. Huh? Anyway, um, Five what? Five, Five easy pieces? Yeah. No, it's a Jack Nicholson movie about a piano player. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so they, they describe here. Five mutations in two genes allow the virus to spread between mammals. What's more, the virus is just as lethal despite the mutation. So hold on to that, just as lethal, okay? The virus is transmitted as efficiently as seasonal flu. And then this fellow, Peter Doherty, he won a Nobel Prize for immunology. This shows clearly that H5 can change in a way that allows transmission and still cause severe disease in humans. Did I tell you any human experiments so far? Of course not, you can't do them. What is he talking about? This fellow is a Nobel laureate, and he's saying this virus has been shown to transmit in humans. Okay, let's see. Here are the, let's see, I, I put some uh, arrows here. So this, this is the experiment, 10 passages in ferrets. The 10th round of ferrets shed an N5, N5, H5N1 strain that spread the ferrets in separate cages and killed them. Okay, hold on to that. We'll see if that's right. All right, anything else? All the mutations have been seen separately in H5N1 from birds. So the mutations they saw after passage in ferrets, they then went to the database of H5N1 strains that have been isolated and sequenced, and they could find each of them separately. Look what Fouché says. If they occur separately, they can occur together. Does that make sense to you? Just because you have mutations in two different viruses, does that mean they can occur in the same virus? I hope all of you would say resoundingly no because genetics says that putting them together could have a different effect. So I don't know where this comes from. And finally, Malik Pierce, who is a very good virologist in Hong Kong, he says uh, this means transmissible H5N1 can evolve in birds. I don't know why he says that. This is a, a ferret experiment. Anyway, a lot of scientists, in addition, in, in, this, in these early days, making silly uh, statements. Now the NSABB steps in. This is the... <coughs> National Science Advisory Board for Biosecurity. It's a federal advisory committee that is supposed to provide oversight uh, and look at research that has a good scientific purpose but could be misused by the wrong people, could be a biological threat. NSABB it consists of experts in all areas of science and policy and law and publishing. When you submit a paper to virology journals, there's a little box there. If you're a reviewer, it says, check this box if the experiments are of cons potential concern to the NSABB, and then they will have 
a look at it. We, we were fortunate to have a member of this committee on TWIV uh, not too long ago. So NSABB's statement is shown here, life science research is important, yet uh, research that is, is good can also yield information that can be misused. And they call this a dual use research of concern. So the most highly dangerous research with the highest potential for yielding products that could be misapplied, dual research of concern or DERC to use their acronym, that's what they're looking for. So they've defined this research that can be reasonably anticipated to provide uh, something that would pose a threat. So they look for this in publications. They're an oversight uh, bureau that looks for this. And they got involved uh, with the H5N1 story because this is on their list of, of toxins and agents that are uh, potentially involved in dual use research. So you can see uh, H5 influenza viruses, where is it here? Avian influenza virus, highly pathogenic. So not just H5N1, but any highly pathogenic flu strain. Ebola virus, foot and mouth disease, Marburg, the 1918 virus. Rinderpest, the virus of cattle. You could not infect people with it, but you could kill cows globally, so that's a problem. Uh, and smallpox viruses. And then if you do any of these things to the viruses or bacteria listed here, uh, you're subject to review by NSABB. So for example, increases the transmissibility or the ability to disseminate the agent. So that's why they looked at these studies. And they held back publication of the H5N1 uh, results. Two members, I love these quotes, from two members of this NSABB. I actually don't love these quotes, but I, I love them in quotes. Paul Keim, I can't think of another pathogenic organism as scary as this one. Richard Ebright, this work should never have been done. It really bothers me when people say work should not be done because I think scientists should be allowed to do the work that, that they've thought of. That's how science works. And looking at an experiment in hindsight like that I don't think is appropriate. So NSABB said, we've looked at this paper, it's too dangerous. We can't publish this because a terrorist could make a biological weapon that would wipe out 59% of the world. You know, direct, <laughs> directly extrapolating from ferrets to people. So in December 2011, I call it a bad day for science, the authors agreed to remove the data. So they're going to take out all the sequences. They're just going to say we passed the virus in ferrets and here is, it's more lethal, but we're not going to tell you what sequences we found in these passage viruses. But if you work on flu, you can apply to see this data and then you could get it. That's what I mean, released only to approved parties. So in my view, this eliminates serendipity, which is 80% of what science is. Somebody looks at something and has an idea and does an experiment and figures it out, whereas everybody else in the field couldn't crack it for years. So that's eliminated by this need to uh, release it only to approved parties. The New York Times weighed in on uh, January of 2012, <laughs> and they said, we usually, um, are good about research, but we don't think that this research should have been done. The potential harm is so catastrophic and the benefits are so speculative. Well, guess what? Any research is pretty speculative. That's how it works. You don't know what's going to happen. This idea that you have to know the benefit of research to prove it being done is crazy in my view because as I said, there's a lot of randomness that happens. Look what they said here. In the process, they created a virus that could kill tens or hundreds of millions of people if it escaped confinement or was stolen by terrorists. This is an absurd statement. I mean, I wrote them a letter, of course, but they, did, they, didn't, they didn't publish it. So I have some friends. They did not publish my letter. No. Um, I, I asked some journalist friends, and they said, the people who write these editorials usually know nothing about science. They know economics or politics or government. So I don't know why they are writing this. I have a feeling someone called them on the NSABB and said, you need to write an editorial because we have to stop this stuff. But this is so wrong, it's amazing. There's so many assumptions here. And the thing is, the New York Times is read by a lot of people, right? And they're going to look at this and go, why? why are we doing this research? So as you might imagine, I got on a campaign to try and publicize what was the right thing to do. That's, that's why I'm telling you this story. So there was a, there's a thing in the New York Times on Sunday called the Dialogue. And they said, we're going to have one on bird flu. And they first publish something, and then you respond to it. All right, so this is what they published, this, this piece by this person, Tom Inglesby, who is 
a director of the Center for Biosecurity. Now there are academic departments whose sole job is to deal with biosecurity. All right, and I, I don't have a general problem with that, but I think that these, these individuals are probably a little bit biased. Tom Inglesby said ferrets are the best model for predicting human flu, so the assumption should be that this new strain would spread among humans. I don't know why you would make such an assumption. Everyone knows that an animal model is called model because it doesn't predict. Yet, uh, Dr. Inglesby is saying he should. And here we go, the potential benefits do not justify the potential dangers. Again, I don't think you can measure the benefits. You have no idea where this is gonna go. And as I'll show you in a moment, this was quite interesting research that we would never have uh, anticipated. So I wrote a, a response to this, which actually they did put on the website, not in the published paper. They left me off the, the, the published paper part, so you can go look at that. All right, so uh, the next question here is um, why were experiments done to adapt H5N1 virus to aerosol transmission among ferrets? <laughs> Everybody answered, everyone through the vaccine. The big one is number three, to identify determinants of aerosol transmission in humans. Number four is what I would have checked. So you can, you, it's hard to know what they were trying to do, but you can't, you can't identify the transmission in humans using a ferret, of course. You can only identify uh, why the virus doesn't transmit in ferrets. But of course, this is how the uh, experiments were viewed by many. Finally, WHO stepped in. I don't know if you know about WHO, it's an international organization. The NSABB is a US government agency. And the WHO in most of Europe and the rest of the world said, why do we have to listen to what the US says? And I don't blame them. So they said, we're gonna publish, you should publish this stuff. And so uh, they decided that the paper should be published. And they said, it's good, it's important for public health to publish this. However, they imposed a moratorium on research for a year to try and uh, communicate better to the world why these experiments were being done. So I, th I think that was good. Meanwhile, in February of 2012, Fouché gave a talk at a biodefense conference, and he showed some slides, and I actually captured these from the webinar as he was giving his talk, all right? And this is his experiment. He took a wild-type H5N1 or his mutated H5N1, and this is the one where he made three amino acid changes, I think, in the receptor binding site and the RNA polymerase. Uh, and he puts them in ferrets, and then he looks for transmission. So this is the first ferret. Uh, the virus, this is virus replication over time. Uh, and then in the next cage, there's no virus in this ferret. So the virus did not transmit from the donor to the recipient when wild type H5 was used. When he used his modified virus, you can see the recipient did make a little bit of virus. Uh, and then as this was passed, so if the, he took the virus from this recipient and put it in a donor again, and that donor passed it on to the recipient. So he did that 10 times to get his mutations. And he still doesn't tell us what the mutations are in this talk. But now in this slide, he shows us the laboratory modified virus is not lethal upon aerosol transmission. Now, I don't know if you remember, but he said very clearly in his interviews that it's just as lethal as H5N1 wild type. So here you inoculate intranasally with either wild type H5 or his mutated H5. Uh, two out of two, one out of three ferrets are dead. If you do aerosol transmission, wild type you don't do because it doesn't transmit by aerosol, but the mutated H5N1 passed 10 times in ferrets, which transmits by aerosol, doesn't kill any of the ferrets. So it transmits from ferret to ferret, but doesn't kill any of them. It only kills them when you put the virus intratracheally. Both wild type or the mutated virus will kill the ferret when you put a tube all the way down into the lung and spray the virus in that way. So Fouché said it was fully virulent, but he, what he left out was that it's fully virulent only when you inoculate intratracheally, not when it spreads by aerosol. Now, if you may remember when we talked about virulence, how I emphasize virulence depends on many things, including the route of inoculation. So he left that out in his discussions with the press, and unfortunately, um, this virus is not lethal when transmitted by aerosol. 
So it's not likely that it would wipe out the world if it were released. So the NSABB reconsidered, the, the head of NIAID, Tony Fauci, said you guys should relook at this, and they did, and they decided they would reverse their decision and let the stuff be published. They said the data are not dangerous and we need to understand these mutations. Uh, we had a very nice debate at a New York Academy of Sciences meeting uh, at the beginning of that year. It's, it's on the web, you can still see it. Uh, this is Lori Garrett who thinks that all scientists are evil and should be censored and prevented from doing any kind of experiment. And this is Michael Osterholm, who is a big anti-bioterror guy at the University of Minnesota. Peter Palazzi is here. I was here, they cut me off because they, <laughs> they, they didn't like what I had to say, but you can hear me. So Osterholm is on the NSABB, or he was on it at the time of this decision. And he wrote a letter subsequently to NIH and he said, he didn't want the, the Fouché paper to be published. He said the meeting at which it was decided was designed to approve of the paper and we didn't have any kind of consideration of the risk benefit. Again, the risk benefit where you can't tell the benefit in scientific research. Um, and he, he said that this was ba basically a bogus procedure. So Osterholm made these comments pri uh, public after the reversal of the NSABB. So then the Senate moves in. They decided they had to investigate the work of Fouché and Kawaoka. They wanted to know why uh, Osterholm had made these charges and what was going on. And so they had a hearing about this. Nothing came of this, fortunately. But you can imagine the Senate saying, you know, if we're going to make a biological weapon, we really shouldn't fund this kind of work. So you have to be really careful when, when you get involved in this. Finally, the papers came out uh, later that year. First one was Kawaoka's paper. What he did is he mutagenized the H5 to allow it to bind to uh, human sialic acid receptors. He got two amino acid changes there. And then he put the H5HA into a seasonal H1N1, uh, which had emerged in 2009. So it's just the H5HA and every other gene is H1N1. Uh, and then he infected ferrets with them, didn't replicate quite very well, but the viruses that came out had two changes in them in the HA shown here, which allowed it to transmit by aerosol. And all of this, of course, Kawaoka hasn't said anything to the press, so we really had no idea what he had been doing. So here's a model of the HA. Uh, the receptor binding site is up here in yellow. And um, again, he introduced by uh, selection two changes in the HA that allow binding to human receptors. And then when this virus was passed in ferrets, he got two additional changes, one up here at the top, N158D, and one down in the stem, which was quite surprising. To make a long story short, it turns out that these originally two uh, HA mutations that allow binding to human receptors destabilize the protein. So by passing it in ferrets, he selected for second site mutations. That's what the 158 and 318 are, which stabilize the structure of the protein. So it's very interesting that adapting to human structures destabilizes the protein. And to get transmission, to make a more stable protein, you have to take care of that problem. Uh, Fouché's paper was then published. Uh, and he, again, he introduced uh, mutations here and here to allow human sialic acid receptor binding. He also introduced the RNA polymerase change to allow uh, efficient replication. And then his passage in ferrets yielded uh, the changes shown in red. Uh, again, here, two near the, sorry, the red or Kawaoka, he selected for a change at 156 and 103. And we don't know whether these uh, had the same effects as Kawaoka's, in other words, destabilizing and stabilizing, but I suspect they do. So again, those are the changes that allow transmission by aerosol in, in ferrets. And these are pictures of the HA where, showing where the sialic acid binds. Uh, the sialic acid binding site is at the top of the protein. Since the work was done, a few groups have crystallized the sialic acid, both human and avian sialic acids, in, into wild type and mutant strains. So here's the HA. We're zooming in on the sialic acid binding pocket. Here's the HA of the transmissible mutant. And you can see how human sialic acids uh, and avian sialic acids bind. They bind very differently uh, into this pocket. Uh, and they also bind quite differently to the wild type. Uh, H5N1 as well. And what's become clear from these kinds of analysis is that in order to infect uh, humans efficiently, or at least ferrets, 
not only does the H5 virus have to gain alpha-2-6 sialic acid binding, but it really has to lose a lot of alpha-2-3 sialic acid binding. And the Kawaoka and Fuchsia mutants did not do that. They gained some alpha-2-6, but they still bound to alpha-2-3. And some predictions have been made based on these structures. And it will only take one or two additional amino acids to abolish avian sialic acid binding in these H5 uh, hemagglutinins. And whether or not that's going to happen, whether it's compatibility, it's compatible with uh, the virus surviving is, is really not known. Next question is, what is important for aerosol transmission of H5N1 virus among ferrets? Well, I guess I'm not making my points very clearly on this last lecture of 2014. All of the above are important. PB2, E67K, that's the RNA polymerase mutation. You need that present for the virus, the virus to replicate in human cells. You need HA changes that allow binding to F26, and you need changes that stabilize uh, the protein. So it's all of the above. A few months later, the headlines returned. Uh, H5N1 had quieted down for a while. Now here are two headlines. Chinese scientists create new killer flu. And this is, uh, senior scientists have criticized the appalling irresponsibility of researchers in China who have deliberately created new strains. They warn that there's a danger that these strains could wipe out the globe, killing millions of people. Similar story here, made in China killer flu virus. So a virologist at the Pasteur Institute in Paris spoke out against these experiments. He didn't like them. And the press, of course, picks this up when one scientist criticizes the work of another. Well, what were these experiments? I actually like them. The question was, if you make, if could H5N1 reassort with the currently circulating flu strain, H1N1, could it reassort, giving a virus that would be transmitted by aerosol? So what they did is to make 100, all 127 possible different reassortants of H5 and H1N1, and then they tested them for transmission, they used a guinea pig model, which is different from ferrets, of course. I thought this was a good experiment. Uh, and here are the results. They had viruses that were highly efficiently transmitted. So the H1N1 is highly transmitted among people. It's also highly transmitted among guinea pigs. The H5N1 is not transmitted among people, and it's not transmitted among guinea pigs. Um, you can see here that if you put one gene uh, uh, sorry, one gene from the H1N1 virus into H5, the gene encoding one of the polymerases, this virus will transmit very effectively. It's very different from the results in ferrets. Uh, also, there's, there is uh, one virus here. You just put the HA of H5N1 in the background of H1N1. It transmits uh, efficiently as well. So these are very different. It shows you how animal models are different and they provide a role for other viral proteins in aerosol transmission in an animal model. So these were not at all dangerous, plus none of them were lethal in guinea pigs. So I do not understand the conclusion that these could, if released, cause a global pandemic. I think this is irresponsible writing and irresponsible speaking on the uh, case of the virologist. So here's my view in case you care. <laughs> I think what scientists do is fine to publish. I think if you have good intentions, you should publish it. Restricting publication eliminates serendipity. It helps the terror, it doesn't do anything to the terrorists that you're trying to stop and it impedes our investigation. We're basically letting fear restrict our progress. I think it's fine to talk about safety. I think it's fine to talk about preparedness, but don't let that interfere with the experiments. And most of all, don't second guess experiments. I find a lot of scientists who make comments about uh, papers to the press don't actually read the papers so they don't know what's being done and they can't comment intelligently about them. I think this whole saga, so this whole question of bioterrorism, redaction of data, publication, this was all started by the H5N1 uh, controversy and that was all a result of miscommunication. Fouchier stated things that weren't correct and that started it all. And many individuals who were against doing the work or said it shouldn't be published, I don't think they actually read the papers in the end. In the beginning, they couldn't have. When that New York Times editorial came out, the papers hadn't been published yet. How did they know the results, which I've told you, since told you, are really important and very interesting. 
Uh, so now uh, avian influenza is back in the news. There's currently an outbreak of an H7N9 virus, uh, largely in China. There have been 433 infections, 122 deaths, 28% case fatality ratio. Uh, these viruses have been isolated from chickens and pigeons. There's no human to human transmission. No dis and the problem here is that they're not high pathogenic. So you can't tell when they're circulating in birds. If you have a high pathogenic strain, the birds die off and you know that the virus is present. But here it's much more difficult. 87% of the cases have had contact with poultry uh, at the live bird market. So another example of transmission of avian influenza viruses to humans via these uh, markets. These are the cases so far in China. Uh, you can see they've been scattered over quite a, a wide geographic area, uh, but with many cases in specific areas. This is interesting, Guangdong, which was the origin of the SARS epidemic, also has had quite a number of cases here as well. But it has not spread outside of China and it has not uh, transmitted from person to person. There have been two outbreaks of disease, uh, one in 2013 and uh, one in 2014, which is just dying off now. And these are the total cases in blue, and the, and the light blue are fatalities. This virus is a triple reassortant. So here's the virus as it infects humans. It's composed of the HA gene, shown here in blue, from a, a virus isolated from birds, uh, the NA gene of another virus isolated from wild birds, sorry, ducks and wild birds, and then a third virus contributes the rest of the genes which are shown in red here. And that virus came from chickens. So very careful sampling of uh, animals in the area, at the live markets and in the environment uh, showed this was the case. We don't know where the reassortment occurred, whether there's an intermediate host. We think these infections come through the live poultry markets and that's probably a good reason uh, to close them down. If you look at the sequences, you get some clues about this virus. It has no multiple basic amino acids at the HA cleavage site, so it doesn't have a pantropic potential. And again, these individuals who get infection, the virus doesn't seem to be going outside the respiratory tract. It has a single amino acid change which enhances uh, HA binding to human sialic acids. It also has already the RNA polymerase change, so it has two of the amino acid changes that are important for uh, transmission in humans, but it doesn't transmit it yet. However, an analysis of the binding of sialic acids to the HA of this H7N9 virus shows that probably a single amino acid change could quantitatively shift the binding to alpha-2,6 sialic acids. In other words, eliminate alpha-2,3 binding, which we think is important for aerosol transmission. Despite being around for a couple of years, this hasn't happened yet. So my suspicion is it's not compatible with fitness of the virus and we're not likely to see it. But this is an issue because m all of the major influenza pandemic strains that we've seen over the years arise via the bird reservoir through reassortment. So in 1918, we think the Spanish influenza, which killed millions of people, originated from ducks. Uh, in 1957, the pandemic strain H2N2 that emerged was a reassortment a reassortant of the 1918 virus or a derivative of it with genes from a duck influenza virus. Same in 1968, the H3N2 strain. In, 19, in 2009, the pandemic strain that emerged was a reassortant of viruses that infect uh, various kinds of pigs. And they had avian influenza virus genes, human influenza virus genes, and swine influenza virus genes in that reassortant virus. So the fact that the virus is out there and present in birds and other hosts is really the problem. We, we know that this can happen. We can get reassortants that cause problems, and we really want to be prepared for it. So the last question for you is your opinion. It's, there's no right answer. It is, should scientific results always be in the public domain? You can answer yes or no, or yes, except when they involve dual use research of concern. I'm just curious to see how you feel about this. So please do, do answer all of you. I'm, I'm curious and I'll let you know the final result. I want to thank you for taking this course. 
There are a couple of, a couple of things uh, administratively. So this was taken on the first day. I don't know, we had a lot more people here. There is a, um, there's a survey on coursework. I'd appreciate if you filled it out and let us know what you liked or didn't like about this course. It helps us to make it better. Please finish your quizzes, all right? Because I have a cutoff for making the, the grades. You need to finish them. If any of you missed some and you're dying to do them, let me know. I will have office hours this Friday from 4 to 7 p.m. for any other questions you may have. I'm going to teach a new virology course in the fall, I hope. I'm applying to do that right now through biology. It will be a small class of, say, 30 students, and we're going to do a virus a week. And we'll talk about what's going on in the world. We're going to talk about cool viruses. So that'll be a lot of fun, and we'll be able to have a nice discussion. And lastly, please, yes, what, you have a question? I, I never, I'm never finished, that's the problem. Please don't forget what you've learned here. You know more virology than 99.9% .9 of the world. You're going to go out there and be changers and movers. Remember it. And if you have questions, you can always email me. So thank you very much.